I want to thank the Chicago Council on Global Affairs for hosting me in digs far higher end than I am accustomed to, and I'm sure that many people in this room are accustomed to. Um, I sort of like the cognitive dissonance of attacking capitalism in such gilded surroundings. Um, you know, because the climate crisis is all about cognitive dissonance. It is about trying to hold deeply contradictory ideas in our heads at the same time, and that is really hard to do. Like being told, for instance, uh, by John Kerry that climate change is so serious that it is like a weapon of mass destruction, like being told uh, by the UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon that climate change is the greatest threat facing the human family, and yet, being surrounded all day, every day, by a culture sending us relentless messages to consume more and more of the finite resources that are at the very heart of this culture, and indeed to double down on the highest emitting forms of those resources, oil from the tar sands, um, natural gas from fracking with higher methane emissions to go barreling down the road that is leading us to this crisis. So faced with such contradictory realities, the human mind tends to shut off, tends to find ways to reconcile uh, the irreconcilable by just refusing. This is called denial. And I was struck by this once again this morning while I was listening to CNN um, in the background, as one does in hotel rooms. And, there was a piece on plummeting oil prices, and it was a long piece for, I see other people heard the piece. Um, it was a, 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 a quite an in-depth piece for, for CNN um, on the geopolitical and economic implications of this price drop. Um, it explored everything from the impacts of lower oil prices on uh, Russia and the Ukraine, on Iran's nuclear program, on ISIS funding. It then went into how it was going to impact plane tickets for American holidayers. Um, it talked about the price at the pump, the heating bills, all these ways that it was going to impact our lives. And then I started playing this game that I now sort of play by habit, which is, will they say the C word? Um, will they talk about climate? Um, and of course, they didn't. They didn't mention climate change, even though, of course, the fact that oil is cheaper is relevant um, to, to how we will respond to climate change, because um, if, if oil is cheap, people do tend to burn more of it, especially when there's no price on carbon. And yet, climate didn't come up in that report, as it so often doesn't um, when it should. It occupies this very bizarre place in our culture where most of the, the time it is this great unspoken, where we are in this state of knowing and not knowing at the same time, the thing we always forget to mention. And sometimes something really dramatic will happen, um, and then we will talk about it. Maybe it'll be a really scary report, scientific report, about how Arctic ice is melting much faster than expected, and that will dominate the news for a couple of hours. Um, or maybe there'll be a massive climate march in New York City, and that will be in the news for a whole day. Um, or people sunbathing on the beaches of Chicago in March will get people talking about climate change for the better part of a week. Or a massive storm like Sandy will flood New York's subways, uh, and even Wall Street itself, um, and that will earn a headline on the cover of Business Week that says it's global warming, stupid. And then, poof, it's gone. And we're back to pretending that none of this is actually happening. Now, I should say that I am not pointing fingers. I denied climate change in this way, in this sort of soft denial, on again, off again, uh, way for longer than I care to admit. I knew it was happening. I mean, I'm not saying I was Donald Trump and um, arguing that the continued existence of winter proves that it's all a hoax. But I stayed pretty hazy on the details, and I only skimmed most of the news stories, especially the really scary ones. And I told myself the science was too complicated and that those big green groups that seemed to be so well-funded were probably dealing with it, that it wasn't my issue and I was focused really on more important, more pressing things. Um, 
Now, a great many of us, I think, engage in this kind of soft climate change denial. We look for a split second, and then we look away. Or we look and then we turn it into a joke, like, you know, yeah, sunbathing on the, on the beaches of Chicago in, in winter, more signs of the apocalypse. Um, or we look but tell ourselves comforting stories about how humans are clever and will come up with a technological miracle that will surely suck the carbon out of the skies or magically turn down the heat of the sun, which is another way of looking away. Or we look but we try to be hyper-rational about it, like dollar for dollar, it's more efficient if we focus on economic development than climate change, as if having a few more dollars will make much of a difference when your city is underwater which is a way of looking away if you happen to be a policy wonk. Or we look, but we tell ourselves that all we can really do is focus on ourselves, uh, shop at farmer's markets and ride our bikes or maybe a hybrid, um, but forget about actually trying to change the systems that are making the crisis inevitable because that's a lot of bad energy and it'll never work. And at first, this may appear as if we are looking because we have all the trappings of environmentalism in our daily life, but we still are keeping one eye tightly shut. Or maybe we do look, really look, and then inevitably we seem to forget, remember for a while, and then forget again. Climate change is like that. It's hard to keep it in your head. We engage in this on-again, off-again form of ecological amnesia for perfectly rational reasons. We deny because we fear that letting in the full reality of this crisis will change everything. And we are right. Now, the reason I called the book This Changes Everything is not because I'm unbelievably arrogant, although I may be. Um, I called the book This Changes Everything because I think that that we need to start our conversations about climate change in 2014 with the acknowledgement that we have procrastinated for so long that there are now no non-radical options left on the table. If we stay on the road we're on, we face radical changes to our physical world. Um, this we hear not only from our leading climate scientists, but from some of our most conservative and establishment institutions, like the World Bank, like the International Energy Agency, like Price Waterhouse Cooper, right? Not just me and my friends um, in the climate movement. Uh, what these institutions are telling us is that we are on a road towards four to six degrees Celsius of warming. So at the high end, 10.7 Fahrenheit. Now that's a big problem because when our governments met in Copenhagen in 2009, they agreed to keep warming below two degrees Celsius because anything above that was considered far too dangerous. And at the time, and I was reporting from the summit in, in Copenhagen, that two degree target was incredibly controversial. In fact, African delegates walked out and marched through the halls accusing northern delegates of genocide. They said Africa will fry at two degrees warming, and yet we are headed towards four to six degrees if we engage in what the World Bank calls business as usual. So under these scenarios, everything changes about our physical world. We don't know exactly what it looks like, but yeah, we know whole countries disappear, major cities disappear, massive crop failure at around 60%, and that's without setting off nonlinear tipping points. So the good news is we haven't blown it yet. The good news is there is still time to keep temperatures below two degrees warming. We are still within our global carbon budget. But the bad news is if we are going to stay within it, um, it will require radical changes as well. Not radical physical changes, but radical political and economic changes, deep changes to the political system and the economic system as it is. Um, so the argument uh, that, I, the, uh, that I make in the first part of the book is that if we want to understand why we have failed to respond to the scientific warnings, um, why we have failed to rise to the climate crisis in the way that we have. And the fact that we've failed now is now a pretty uncontroversial statement, right? Our governments have been negotiating towards reducing emissions since 1990, and since that time, emissions have gone up by 61%. 
This is not a record of success. And emissions continue to go up year after year. Um, so a lot of theories have been floated to explain this failure. Human nature, well, it's really hard to get governments to agree on anything. And there's truth in all of these theories, right? Um, it is climate change is a, 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 a sort of difficult to grasp abstract issue, or at least it used to be, right? Um, but now it's kind of banging down the doors. This is no longer a grandchildren issue. This is an us issue, and yet we're still deferring. We're still looking away. So I don't think the human nature argument holds water anymore. Um, and then this idea that governments can't cooperate is also a, a little problematic because in these very same years, our governments cooperated to, for instance, build the World Trade Organization, which is an incredibly complex institution with uh, elaborate rules and penalties and enforcement. So they're able to agree on some things across borders. They just haven't been able to agree on this thing. Um, so the argument I make um, is, that, is that what we haven't looked at is the catastrophic case of historical bad timing that this particular issue has faced, that it landed on our collective laps at the worst possible moment in our ideological evolution. And that moment was 1988. 1988 was not the year scientists uh, found out about climate change, but it was the year that we collectively lost all plausible deniability, and it became the group political issue. Um, it was the year that James Hansen testified on Capitol Hill and said that he could now say with a high degree of certainty that there was a connection between emissions and warming. Um, it was the year that governments met for the first time um, at, a, at a climate conference to discuss emission reductions. It was in Toronto. It was the year that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change was formed, 1988. Um, and, uh, and it was also the year that when the editors of Time had to choose their man of the year, they were still calling it a man of the year in 1988, they settled on planet Earth, our planet in peril, which is just an indication of how mainstream, how top of mind this issue was. This was the moment we were going to act. So what else was going on in 1988? Um, well, it was the year that Canada and the U.S. signed uh, the first big free trade agreement that was eventually expanded into NAFTA, which became the prototype for dozens of deals like it around the world. It was the year before the Berlin Wall collapsed and Francis Fukuyama, who I believe you are about to host, and um, already just hosted, yes, um, declared that history was over um, and that there was now only one economic model to rule the world and political model. Um, this was the height of what used to be called the Washington Consensus. And we're all at the Chicago School of Economics, I should mention that as well. The ascendant moment of this ideology, and we're all familiar with it, right, the pillars of this ideology. Privatization, deregulation, tax cuts paid for with cuts to social spending, all locked in under these investor rights deals, these corporate free trade deals. Um, we are pretty familiar with some of the impacts of this ideology, and I'm sure there's uh, extensive debate among people in this room about whether overall the impact has been good. We could have a very lively debate, I'm sure, um, about the connection between this ideology and the erosion of the public sphere on widening inequality, and then people would come back and say, no, it's spread prosperity, and so on. We've been having this debate for a long time. Um, but one, one area that has really been neglected has been how this ideology has impacted our ability to rise to the climate challenge. Now, another local reference. Um, uh, I spent some time with a, with a Chicago institution called the Heartland Institute, um, this sort of ground zero of climate change denialism uh, globally. I, I went to one of their conferences. It, it was in Washington, not Chicago and interviewed many of their, the leading lights of, 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 of the climate change denial movement. And you know, as, as I think you all know, the, the Heartland Institute is not a scientific organization. It is a, it is a hard right, so-called free market think tank that exists to advance um, this worldview, this sort of pro-corporate free market worldview. Um, now when I interviewed the head of the Heartland uh, Institute, Joe Bast, um, you know, I asked him how he became interested in climate change, and he explained that 
He realized that if the science was true, it would mean that the left could pretty much do whatever it wanted. And he said, so I took another look at the science. Um, and so it's important to get the order right. <laughs> um, and, and lo and behold, they found all kinds of problems with the science. But you know, th that chapter of my book is called The Right is Right, and I want to be clear, they're not right about the science, but they are right about the fact that if the science is true, it represents an irreconcilable challenge to that worldview. Um, it is not the end of the world, but it is the end of that particular world, that narrow ideology that Joseph Stiglitz has called market fundamentalism. Um, and, you know, just to, to, to get concrete about that, um, you know, obviously climate change is the, the very essence of a collective crisis. Um, it requires unprecedented cooperation within countries and between countries. And yet, it hit us at this moment when we were being told that there was no such thing as society, to quote Margaret Thatcher, and that we're all just atomized, greed-seeking individuals, and indeed there's something sinister about collective action, and something wrong with governments planning economies. That's what the Soviet Union did. Um, regulation became a dirty word, but of course, if you're going to take climate change seriously, you have to get in the way of polluters. You have to say no to certain activities that are harmful. And we had an environmental movement that did whatever it could to try to avoid that. No, we can set up emission trading schemes, market-based solutions. We can respond to this as consumers. We can change what we buy. But that didn't work, and it isn't working, uh, because it does require these more robust market interventions. And I would argue that the guys at the Heartland Institute understand this a lot better than a great many liberals who are in their own form of denial. And I said, we're all in it. We all have our own special forms of denial. Um, but this bad case, this case of bad timing has meant that we are ruled by a class of politicians globally, regardless of party, who know only how to dismantle and starve public institutions just when they most need to know how to build them, um, how to transform them. And of course, if we're going to take climate change seriously, we need to invest massively in the public sphere. Massively in the public sphere to get ourselves off fossil fuels. We need to invest in uh, decentralized renewable energy grids. We need to invest in public transit and light rail. We need to reinvent the way we move around, how we live in our cities. This requires deep levels of planning. Um, but it also requires just basic investments in the public sphere to protect ourselves from the heavy weather that we've already locked in, because we're no longer talking about stopping climate change. We're talking about stopping catastrophic climate change, but we've already locked ourselves into some pretty heavy weather. And we see again and again um, how dangerous it is when that heavy weather intersects with weak and neglected public infrastructure and public institutions. Now, I end my last book, The Shock Doctrine, um, with Hurricane Katrina, because that collision was so dramatic when Katrina uh, uh, slammed into those neglected levees, and then the, the, the state that one would have expected to have some sort of evacuation plan um, to be able to respond to the humanitarian crisis in the city just didn't seem to be home. And I think many of us remember that sense of shock, like, wait a minute, is it possible that FEMA cannot find the city of New Orleans for five days while people were standing on their roofs holding signs that said help, um, while people were left in the Superdome without food and water? That is what makes a disaster, a catastrophe, that collision between heavy weather and weak infrastructure. So of course, we need to invest in the public sphere on all of these fronts, yet we're facing this crisis at a time of relentless public austerity. Um, now, if we were able to switch gears, we would be able to create huge numbers of jobs. We would be able to address our economic crisis, our jobs crisis, um, and our ecological crisis at the same time. But we lack that political leadership that has the vision to do so. Um, Another way that this case of bad timing has played out has to do with those free trade deals. And I'll tell you a little story about um, a factory near where I live in Toronto. Um, it's, the, it's a factory called Silfab. It's not a very glamorous place. It's on the outskirts of Toronto, on the, you know, near the ass end of a multiplex and a juice factory. It's not very glamorous, but a really interesting story is playing out in this, in this factory. It used to be an auto parts plant. 
Um, and it was closed down during the economic downturn at, when, when the big three automakers got into trouble after the financial crisis. Um, a, lot of, uh, auto, a lot of auto industry in Canada was closed down after the U.S. government bailed out the big three automakers. Well, once you've taken all this taxpayer money, it's easier to close plants in Canada than it is in the U.S. for obvious reasons. So we were facing a manufacturing crisis in Ontario. It was also linked to the fact that we've been in the middle of this oil boom, uh, thanks to the Alberta tar sands, which has inflated our dollar um, and has made Canada a much more expensive place to manufacture. So the Ontario government um, came up with a, a really quite good plan, a green energy plan, a bold plan that had the most ambitious carbon reduction targets of anywhere in North America. This is now 2009. Um, but it was also a plan to revive the local manufacturing sector. So they introduced a feed-in tariff program, um, and they said that anybody who wanted to take advantage of this feed-in tariff program, which had all kinds of benefits, stable pricing and so on, um, had to produce between 40 to 60 percent of their solar panels and wind turbines in Ontario. So it was a way to address the jobs crisis and the, uh, the, the climate crisis at the same time, the kind of thing we really need. And Silfab, this factory, became a, a sort of poster child for it because this former auto parts plant reopened and was turned into a solar panel plant. And a lot of the workers who had lost their jobs working at Chrysler and GM and Magna, the auto parts company, got jobs making solar plants. And it actually requires many of the same skills. Um, so it was the perfect just transition story, a way to bring labor and the environmental movement together. And everyone was happy. And then Japan and the European Union complained to the World Trade Organization and said, well, this violates Canada's obligations under the WTO because this is protectionist. You're, we demand equal access to the Canadian market for our wind turbines and solar plants and solar panels. And in fact, there have been a number of these trade challenges. Um, the U.S. has challenged China's solar subsidies, India's uh, solar subsidies, and it's kind of amazing because in the climate sphere, you know, when you go to a conference like the one in Copenhagen or uh, the one that's coming up in Paris, all these governments do is point fingers at each other and accuse each other of not moving fast enough on, on climate policy, not being ambitious enough. And then more powerful wings of these same governments race to the World Trade Organi Organization and try to knock down each other's windmills. Um, to quote Joseph Stiglitz again, he says, you know, how absurd that we would leave the fate of the planet in the hands of what he calls silly lawyers um, who didn't understand the rules when they wrote them didn't understand the crisis when they wrote the rules. So one of the things that has been most striking to me is, is that um, you know, the, the trade world and the climate world don't really talk to each other. Uh, in fact, a lot of um, people who you know, are very expert in climate policy have told me that when they read the book, they had no idea these trade challenges were even happening uh, because these worlds are very segregated. We rarely make these connections. And yet, confronting these various structural barriers, whether it is confronting the logic of austerity um, or the anti-taxation logic, anti-regulation logic, or the logic of unfettered free trade, this is responding to climate change. And you know, when I was writing the book, um, you know, I was pretty clear on the diagnosis. You know, that I just kept finding more evidence. But it was a tough book to write. It took me five years. And you know, a lot of that was because I was researching and doing, doing, doing a lot of work. But it was also just because for the first couple of years, I just was incredibly depressed. I mean, I was just reading this. And I just, you know, I, the scale of the problem was so immense. And I didn't see a movement anywhere that was capable of rising to this kind of challenge. We were all in our various silos. And, um, and this has always been kind of the essence of the climate challenge, is that on one side of this issue, you have some very motivated players um, who really, really don't want action. <laughs> um, they have trillions of dollars on the line. That's what we understand now, thanks to the breakthrough research out of the 
Carbon Tracker Institute in the UK that calculated how much the fossil fuel industry has in its proven reserves. This is their reserves that are already counted towards their stock price. And they found that they had five times more carbon than the atmosphere can absorb and still leave us with a 50-50 chance of keeping temperatures below that two degree Celsius target. So that means that if we ever get our act together and have a science-based climate policy, they have trillions of dollars in stranded assets. So no wonder they fight like they mean it, right? They fight with urgency, dare I say creativity. They buy off politicians. They fund the denier movement. On the other side, you have some very motivated climate activists, some of whom are in this room. Um, but you also have a kind of a mushy middle um, of people who care about climate on a good day, you know? Um, you know, when asked to rank the issues that they care about, climate always comes in last after every other issue, jobs, health care. Um, and po our politicians get those messages. And the message is, you know what, people aren't going to vote over this issue. So if you have to choose between the people who feel really strongly and are going to fight like hell, and these people who are sending these sort of mixed messages of, eh, kind of care, maybe not, um, then you know how that's going to end up. You know how that story is going to end. But something started to change about two and a half years ago in my research, in my experience, just a sort of a subtle shift where I started to see signs of the kind of movement that could actually win. Um, and I think for me, and this is sort of arbitrary, it began with the fight against the Keystone XL pipeline. Um, and that was a real shift in the climate movement here in this country. It was a shift in tactics. We started to see a lot more civil disobedience. Um, you know, more than a thousand people getting arrested in Washington. And, you know, I was part of those protests, and I'm a member of the board of directors of 350.org and a close colleague of Bill McKibben's. And, you know, what a lot of what was driving people to decide to get arrested, people like James Hansen, you know, several climate scientists were arrested as part of that, faith leaders, people like Gus Beth, was this desire to break that cognitive dissonance, to bring their actions um, in line with the urgency of the crisis, if only in their personal life. Um, in the Keystone XL fight, this word emerged uh, to describe the movement called Blockadia. That's what the activists in Texas called their protest camp when they started to build the southern leg of the pipeline. They said, welcome to Blockadia. Um, and Blockadia, it's not just about the Keystone uh, pipeline. It's really this, this new radical movement. It's cropping up um, wherever extreme energy projects are pushing forward. It's really the flip side of the extreme energy boom in which we find ourselves. Um, that as fracking spreads across the continent, um, as coal export terminals are planned up and down the Pacific Northwest, um, as the tentacles uh, um, reach from the, the Alberta tar sands to try to get that diluted bitumen somehow to the sea, resistance movements rise up everywhere. Um, and this, in a way, is a product of overreach by the fossil fuel uh, sector, of going into parts of the country um, where they are much less welcome, where they are seen much more, as much more of a threat to other industries. This movement is sometimes called the, an anti-fossil fuel movement. I think it's much more accurate um, to call it a pro-water movement, because in fact, water, a uh, fear about water safety, and I know there are uh, the, several people here from Food and Water Watch, um, and, and their very name points to what is driving this activism. Uh, fear about water, also fear about, about, about air, um, and, and, and rising asthma levels in so many communities. Um, and a few weeks ago, we saw an incredible, uh, incredible, display in New York City, 400,000 people marching through the, through the streets. I want to acknowledge my friend um, Emma Ruby Sachs, who was one of the key organizers of that spectacular march, who's here today. Um, and it was amazing. It was amazing, and it was amazing not just because of the numbers, though the numbers were amazing, but because it was the manifestation of this largely underground movement, you know, that we, that doesn't make the news. All of these place-based movements, um, movements that really aren't driven by hate, but are actually driven by love, by a profound love of place, a desire to protect their, the ho their homelands, um, and also by a desire to protect 
bodies to protect partic particularly children's bodies. It's a movement that's overwhelmingly led by women. Um, and so we saw the anti-fracking movement out in force, fighting to protect New York's anti-fracking moratorium. The movement was led by indigenous people who live downstream from the Alberta tar sands and are dealing with the direct health impacts of that flaying of the land. Um, and there were also communities like um, the South Bronx who are dealing with soaring asthma levels, but also see in a just response to climate change the chance for investments in their ailing infrastructure and job creation and a real potential for hope. And that, the emergence of this movement, of this new climate movement, is what ultimately allowed me to finish this book. Because at certain points, I really wasn't even sure what the point of writing a book like this for, if there isn't a movement that can take it and run with it. Um, you know, I've always been really lucky with my books that they sort of come out in these movement moments. Um, no Logo, my first book was at the printer when the protests in Seattle um, were happening. Um, and The Shock Doctrine came out just before uh, Wall Street melted down and these anti-austerity protests took place. And, um, and, this, and, and this movement started bubbling and I suddenly understood um, that it did make sense. It did make sense to draw these connections because we do need a response to climate change that is um, in line with science but also is a justice-based response that says that the people who need to benefit from this transition are the people who've been hurt the most by the old model. Um, that's what climate justice means. And we are seeing these signs all over the place. Now, just in closing, because I'm running out of time, I just want to confess to you that I do have some friends in the climate movement who have taken me gently aside and said, you know, Naomi, um, climate was already big enough. Did you have to make it about capitalism? Um, and I understand their concern. <laughs> but I actually think that telling the truth about the connection between a system based on unfettered greed um, and climate change actually makes this an easier battle to fight. Because here's what we actually have to remember. It's not like we're talking about an economy that is working beautifully, except for the small matter of rising sea levels. We're talking about allowing sea levels to rise in the name of protecting an economic system that is failing the vast majority of the people on this planet with or without climate change. This is a system that has already sacrificed a great many people's job security, their homes, their right to a good public education, to decent health care, and now that same system is making it clear that it's willing to sacrifice the stability of the planet's life support systems, and we simply cannot let it. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for that enlightening talk. We'll now go out to the audience for your questions. I'm sure there'll be plenty. So please raise your hand, uh, wait for a mic. Please keep your question to a question. And yes, right here, the gentleman in the first front row. Oh, do you mind waiting for the mic for just one moment? Where do you see the um, connection between the other big money that comes in the form of foundations, Gates, Rockefeller, Carnegie, um, Ford, some of these foundations that at one point provide NGO services, but at the other point advance a, uh, an agenda of the neoliberal agenda. Where does that fit into your, your thinking? Thank you, Johnny. Um, Chicago boy. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's, that's a really key question. And, and um, did everyone hear the question? He's a bit of a mumbler. Um, he <laughs> so the question was, um, what is the connection between um, the response or the failure to respond um, and, and, and foundation funding from some of the big kind of liberal foundations like Ford and Carnegie and Rockefeller and who else? Foundation. Gates? Yeah. 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 We, we, we're actually trying to fundraise for a film right now. No, we're just um, <laughs> no I, it's actually, it, it, I think it is really a, an important question. Um, not just 
about climate change, but more broadly, how foundation funding um, impacts uh, progressive movements and and the the presence or lack thereof of broad-based social movements. You know, I talked a lot about silos. You know, the way people you know stay in their little categories, and um, and there's not a lot of cross-pollination. Unlike on the right, right, where um, this project that I'm you know that that sort of big neoliberal shift, that Thatcher-Reagan moment, was the product of a lot of corporate funding and right-wing foundation funding, like SCAFE and, and, and Koch brothers, obviously, um, very deliberately building a social movement and funding a shift in ideology and worldview, right? Not just funding issue campaigns, but, but funding ideas, taking ideas seriously. That's what all those think tanks are about, paying people to think those big thoughts and changing the underlying values of the culture. You know, that's what Thatcher said. You know, she said the method is economics, but the goal is to change the hearts and minds, right? That's exactly what liberal funders don't do. <laughs> um, you, you can fund symptoms of the problem, um, but it's very rare to find funders that are willing to fund those, those big ideas that connect the dots um, and, 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 and connect um, the silos to, to build that, that broad-based movement. And there's often, I think, a real false equivalency that gets made of like, you know, the, the right has, has the Koch brothers and the, the left has Soros. Um, but that would assume that, you know, the, those, that those big liberal funders actually do fund equivalent I ideas and projects. And, and what I find is um, there's a huge amount of reluctance on that and that a lot of the siloing is a result of this desire to look just at the symptoms um, and, and to fix them, a genuine desire to fix them, um, but not, uh, you know, not, not get at those structural issues. Now, there have, there, you know, something, I didn't mention the divestment movement, which is something else that's given me a, a lot of hope in, in recent years, the emergence of the fossil fuel divestment movement um, on hundreds of university campuses and faith organizations, um, at city councils, uh, people taking that research I mentioned that shows that the fossil fuel companies have five times more carbon than, um, you know, than, than can safely be burned, um, and, and saying, you know, these are immoral profits. We, it is not okay to profit from businesses that, that have that business model. And uh, it was quite interesting a month ago when, when the Rockefellers joined the fossil fuel divestment movement. Um, it was interesting for a lot of reasons, right? I mean, the Rockefeller, the, that, that name is synonymous with fossil, fossil fuels. Um, Valerie Rockefeller Wayne, um, who was speaking on behalf of the family, uh, said specifically, she said, precisely because our money was made in oil means that we have a moral responsibility to fund the transition away from oil, um, which I think is absolutely true. But I don't think it can just be left to the goodwill of foundations and individuals. The most significant part of that to me is that it sets a precedent for demanding a polluter pays regulatory framework. Like we don't just, nice as it is, we don't just need the Rockefeller Foundation's money out of fossil fuels. We, we need Exxon's profits to fund this transition. You know, Exxon being the, 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 one of the, one of the uh, sort of children of, the, of Standard Oil after the breakup. Uh, so, so that, you know, demanding that, those types of, of policies, I think, does test some of, some of the foundations. But I think there are some signs of change, to be honest with you. Um, and I, I think seeing that march for a lot of funders, um, I hope, was a wake-up call um, about the fact that we need to be funding the grassroots, not just the big, slick, green NGOs who've gotten overwhelmingly received the bulk of funding so far. We need to be funding frontline communities, communities of color, um, and you know the, the 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 research on environmental funding is quite devastating about how neglected um, frontline communities are, and and. and uh, environmental justice organizations led by people of color are in the scheme of environmental grant making. I think it's around 11%. There's been a lot of studying of this, and it's it's ugly. Um, so, on the other hand, people were anyone who was in New York during that march was so excited by the potential that it represented that I'm hoping that that translates into a shift in funding patterns. 
Ultimately, however, I don't think the revolution will be funded by um, foundations. I think that we need other funding models um, and, uh, and, and that, it, that we need more membership-based funding models and, and more creative models like you know, worker co-ops and things like that. All right, next question, please. Yeah, why don't we go over here? Uh, the woman in the red shirt, uh, Kaylin, on the other side of the column from you. Hi, um, uh, I wonder if you could say a little bit more about how the capitalist and neoliberal paradigm is very much constructed um, on environmental racism. And you've brought that up a little bit, uh, touching on Katrina, um, though not calling it that in that case. Um, and you just touched on it a little bit more, but I wonder uh, how the environmental movement needs to incorporate that more centrally in their rhetoric and in their work, um, uh, and how you, how you think about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think in many ways um, the, the, the heart of this issue is the sort of the extractivist logic, right? The, 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 it's not just about capitalism, I and mean, we know that socialism was brutal to, for the environment as well. So it isn't even just a, a left-right issue. It's you know any um, all of our industrial uh, um, systems have uh, created. In environmental crises and are based on the logic of the sacrifice zone, right? I mean, ever since we started um, engaging in industrial scale extraction, it's been based on this idea that there are acceptable sacrificial people and sacrificial places. And this idea was has been intimately linked with colonialism from the start and the whole the idea of the frontier mentality. Um, you know, in the book, I have a, a chapter starting uh, um, with the island of Nauru uh, in the South Pacific because it is this incredible metaphor of the sort of extractivist mind um, because it is this island that has been, literally been mined to death. It, it's made of very rich phosphate rock um, and it was mined by the Australians and the Germans and it's been completely hollowed out. It's just this ring of, of, of this ring around, around the island where it's possible to live after hollowing out the whole center, just mining it deliberately to get um, with the goal of, of settling its residents elsewhere. Australia was open about this when it controlled the island, that eventually everybody would have to move. And that was an acceptable price for progress, right? Um, and now, I mean, the reason why Nauru is such a powerful image is because now the sea levels are rising. So after disappearing from the inside, now it's disappearing from the outside. And um, some of the leaders on Nauru have, you know, have has stepped into this leadership role on the climate stage, saying, you know, we are your, your future. Um, you know, if you want to know what it looks like to mine yourselves to death, look at Nauru. This is where this logic leads. So I think that. Um, I, I, I think ultimately what we are talking about is moving towards an energy system that requires no sacrifice zones. Um, and that is why we need a renewable-based renewable system. It is possible to power our lives without sacrificing people's health and their, their beloved places. Um, it's always been uh, the most marginalized people that have been sacrificed. It's always been intimately linked to race and notions of racial superiority. Um, what's happening now is, as I said, the system is becoming, um, you know, we're in the middle of this extreme energy boom that is bringing a whole lot of people who have historically been privileged and outside of that sacrifice zone mentality, right? You know, the country houses in Pennsylvania are facing fracking and they're going, well, I don't like this, right? Um, and that is building some new and powerful alliances between, you know, for instance, the Cowboys and Indians Alliance along the line of the Keystone XL pipeline. Um, you know, indigenous people have always been on the receiving end of extractivist policies, um, but now they're forming alliances with people who um, have been sort of traditional winners of this economic model. Um, and that has real potential for building political power. All right, uh, next question, please. Uh, yes, uh, the woman in the uh, third row, right in the middle here. Um, hi. Oh, do you mind waiting for the mic for just a moment? Hi, um, thanks for your great talk. And can you speak a little bit about our political system? <laughs> We're talking a lot about economics. Mm -hmm. um, and capitalism, mm -hmm. and um, so I'd be interested in hearing what you have to say about how we could prioritize our our energies and um, in including changing our political system. Yeah. 
Well, I think these issues are, thank you. I think these issues are really related because um, you know, most, most, a lot of the time when we talk about the failures of our political system, it has to do with corporate influence over the political system and, and the, the ways in which that has put um, it, you know, distorting pressure of various kinds, you know, whether it's redistricting or whether it's just blocking needed policies through the outsized role of lobbying and so on. Um, but this whole sort of corporate liberation project that uh, I've been outlining one part of that has been the ascendancy of the corporate person um, and, uh, and, and exercising those so-called free speech rights um, in the political sphere. So, uh, you know, I, and I have to tell you, you know, I, I've, laun like I, I've launched the books simultaneously in Canada and the UK and the US, and it's been really striking how in this country, um, uh, you know, this is what people want to talk about, right? That this, there is such a deep understanding that, um, you know, that nothing can be fixed, you know, whatever it, the issue is that you're passionate about, nothing can be fixed until these structural issues um, around a broken electoral system and a broken campaign finance and lobbying system um, and corporate personhood, these sort of deep structural issues are addressed. So my hope is simply um, that climate change can provide an infrastructure for, for coalition building because it does affect everybody. It is the ultimate political tent, you know, the Earth's atmosphere, we're all under it already. Um, and it puts us on a deadline. Um, it puts us on this science-based deadline. And this is why, you know, I start the book about, you know, how we all look away and started the talk tonight about, about all the ways we look away because I think we exert a huge amount of energy not looking at climate change, you know. Um, and, and a lot of what we call apathy is thinly disguised terror. Um, and we don't look because we don't see a way out. So, um, but on the other hand, fear is a really powerful motivator. <laughs> Existential terror, you know, it'll make you leap, but you need somewhere to jump to. So, I mean, I think the flaw of the environmental movement is thinking that fear alone is a motivator, right? I will just scare you and you will become an activist. Um, and actually, scaring people makes them want to curl up in a ball, you know? Um, what makes people leap is the vision of a future that is better than the one that they have right now. And you know, coming back to the question around racial and economic justice, you know, the, the frontline communities have to be first in line to benefit from this transition because it's the right thing to do, it's the moral thing to do. But it is also, in my opinion, the best political strategy, the best way of closing that urgency gap that I described earlier of on the one side forces with a whole lot to lose and fighting hard, um, and on the other side, this sort of mushy middle that's not you know, passionate enough um, about acting on climate and still has this idea that you know, it's unconnected to daily realities. If economic and racial justice are at the center of our climate response, if we say the way we respond to this crisis has to heal these wounds, has to bring resources to the people who need them most, um, then those, those constituencies are gonna fight. They're gonna fight for those policies. Um, and that's what I think we caught a glimpse of in the march. And you know, as far as I know, the only way to win a battle against a small gr group of uh, you know, interests with a whole lot to lose is to have a whole lot of people with a whole lot to gain. Um, and that is something the climate movement has never had before. And I think it's starting to build that. All right, next question, please. Uh, yeah, right here in the middle, the, the woman in the third row, please. Just there, with the white shirt, thank you. Hi, uh, first, thank you for linking the topic of climate to capitalism, because I think until people understand how it impacts their pocketbook, it's hard to turn it into what are tangible things you can go do and influence. Um, but I'd be interested in if you could share your observations. You've talked about the tipping point, and I've heard you reference before uh, Denver, Germany, that are you know, places that may be crunchier, if you will, than Chicago. But, what is it, what's the confluence of events that you think creates that tipping point where you've got the front line yeah. hitting the policies and, and creating that momentum? Yeah. Um, 
so Germany, I mean, this is another piece of, of what, you know, I think there are, there, are, there are a few different pieces that should give us hope right now. Um, the, the, the sort of weaving together of Blockadia, the fact that, um, you know, a lot of the people who um, are, uh, 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 for a lot of people, climate change is no longer an abstract issue. I mean, in California right now with the drought, this is like, okay, we get it. Um, and uh, and, and P.S., it's crazy to be pouring water down fracking holes in the middle of a drought, um, so the dots are being connected. But the other piece of this is renewables are ready for prime time, right? And we have research out of Stanford University led by Mark Jacobson and his sort of fantastic team showing us that we can get to 100% renewables by 2030, the technology is there. We can do it with conventionals. We don't need unconventionals to get there, right? Um, and then we have Germany, which is, you, you know, a heavy industrialized economy, um, which now has 25% of its electricity grid powered by renewable energy, much of it decentralized. And what's interesting about Germany, and it's not perfect because, um, you know, on the one hand, you know, you have a government that has been willing to put these powerful incentives in place. Um, you know, Germany is a more social democratic country, and, and, and that's part of the reason they've never gone full tilt neoliberal. And that has to do with their own history. They scare themselves when they do that. Um, <laughs> but we should be grateful for that. Um, but, but, you know, they, 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 Merkel has not been willing to stand up to the, to the coal uh, sector, which is very powerful in Germany. Um, and so they're continuing to dig up coal, and as demand drops in Germany, they're just exporting it. So they're willing to say yes to what they want, but they're still not willing to say no to the fossil fuel companies. So, um, but they're getting there, and, and, they're, and they have some very, very ambitious targets that they're, that they're on the road to meeting. Um, so what's interesting about Germany to, to look at is how this happened. And, um, you know, my, my last book, at the, the, talks about how shocks have been moments uh, that have been harnessed quite systematically by uh, sort of corporate forces to push through uh, um, their version of reality. Um, what happened in Germany is, is, is another, is a different version of this. It was a lot, much of it was a response to Fukushima, right? I mean, there was already an energy plan in place, but Germany had a very strong, has always had a very strong green movement. It has a very strong anti-nuclear movement. And when the meltdown happened in Japan, when Fukushima melted down, the anti-nuke movement in Germany seized on it and was in the streets demanding an acceleration of the energy transition. Um, they also have a, a, a more responsive political system. They have more, uh, um, you know, a more proportional representation. So even though they have, you know, Merkel is no lefty, right? But she has to work with other political parties. That's the way the German parliament works. So I think there's a lot of messages in what's happening in Germany. Not, you know, some of it are, you know, lessons, you know, telling us what not to do. But, you know, in trying to understand how they, they have gotten to 25%, in such a short period of time, and to put that in perspective, this country has 4% of its energy coming from renewables, so it is impressive. Um, it is this convergence of movement power, including direct action, mass movements, and a parliament parliamentary system that works better, right? Um, so it's all of this at once. All right, next question, please. Yeah, the gentleman here in the third row, please. There's someone over there who's had her hand up in the gray shirt. Uh, since we are uh, in somewhat of a gilded room, I wanted to ask about the, the seizure of corporate Winding. profits that you write about in the book. Um, you mentioned in passing the statistic about how oil companies have five times the amount of uh, oil in their reserves that would require to push us past the amount of uh, uh, the amount of oil that would be needed to burn to pass two degrees Celsius uh, temperature raise. Um, as inspiring as, well, first of all, how on earth could we ever overcome that, even as we are, uh, you see, you know, hopeful signs and uh, blockade and things like this. And, and how do you get from, uh, you know, an, a, uh, inspiring movements like 400,000 people in the streets in, in New York City to the point where you'd be able to ever make a dent in that and be able to not just, you know, slowly phase them out of the future, but actively seize uh, what they have, what these oil companies have currently? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, 
Um, it's interesting. The, the, it, it, the four, one thing I did mention about Germany is that they is that they have created 400,000 jobs in the process of switching um, in this way to renewable energy. I was just reminded of that when you said 400,000, um, because that is a motivate that that becomes a motivating factor. And people, you know, once you there is a sort of virtuous cycle that sets in once um, people are getting the benefits of these policies, especially if they're well designed policies. And that the other lesson from Germany is that um, this. This is a feed-in tariff system that systematically encourages local ownership, right? So it isn't just giving the power to big wind and solar companies, although there are some of them in the mix. It's also encouraged the creation of 900 solar cooperatives. Hundreds of cities and towns have voted to take back control over their energy grids, so they're keeping the benefits from from energy production and they're able to pay for their social services. In other words, it's creating constituencies, counterpowers that will fight to protect these interests. Um, and we, you know, I think that is one of the ingredients for, for um, standing up to, to those interests that don't want action. Now in terms of the trillions of dollars, yes, they are counted towards um, their, their stock prices. Um, but you know, it's the, the argument that's being made is that it's a bubble, right? It's not exactly like seizing those assets. It, it, it's that um, this is a bubble, and if we take climate change seriously, then this bubble, like many bubbles before it, um, gets popped, and that wealth kind of evaporates. Um, we need to have a soft landing. We need to have a healthy economy to transition to, which is why we need to be planning and putting this other infrastructure in place. Um, but it isn't like just going in and taking trillions of dollars from ExxonMobil, as tempting as that may be. Um, and uh, I think you know one of the, the precedents for this, I mean, it's, it's really about, you know, there have been moments where um, wealth has shifted in our societies pretty significantly. It happened after the Second World War. It happened when there are huge waves of unionization and workers get a bigger share of the collective wealth. It happens in response to organizing. Um, another example is the abolition movement. I mean, slavery was still profitable. It was still profitable um, in Europe when it was abolished. It was still profitable uh, in this country when it was abolished. Um, and Maybe that's not the best example because of the Civil War, um, but there are precedents um, for stopping still profitable activities because they're morally wrong. Um, and we need to know that history. And one of the lessons of that history is you, you know, you, it, it is important to make cost benefit analyses and, you know, say, okay, well, it makes more sense to invest in climate action now than later. You know, but one of the things we learned from all of these movements is that they spoke in the language of morality as well. They said this is wrong. Um, and that's the kind of climate movement that we're starting to see that is willing to speak in the language of right and wrong. And that, you know, that is, and, and that's part of the reason I think that it's growing as quickly as it is. I think it's really exciting that faith groups are getting as involved as they are, um, that it isn't all being sort of left to actually a very small part of the faith community that is part of the climate change denial movement. Um, but the, you know, at the heart of the divestment movement are you know, churches and synagogues um, that are saying these are immoral prophets. Um, so, you know, it's not going to be easy. <laughs> all right, next question, please. Uh, yes, the, the woman in the fourth row with the gray shirt, please. Straight up, the, yep, to the right. Thank you. Hi. Um, when you speak of ecological racism, um, one of the things uh, that I've noticed that, that with the climate change movement, formerly global warming movement, is um, the reports that we have been getting now for literally 35 years, actually, since things like Bopal back in 1980. 384. And one of the things that I noticed when you talk about like a middle class changing people's opinion, making them change their habits, I think everybody in this room, including me, um, especially particularly in North America, specifically in the United States, it's like, well, how can we um, change our viewpoint? How can we change our government? How can we change ourselves uh, in terms of uh, what we do, our habits, what we support, uh, and also still keep the stuff? You know, I, I want, I'm going to keep my Dodge. I want to keep my apartment. I want to keep my heat on at 85 degrees and walk around buck naked. And then you have, and that's on this side, and people do it. And then you have, I have a neighbor, 
And then that's people on this side of the world. <laughs> Thank you world. for your question. <laughs> on no, the other you're not finished no, yet. No, no. And on the other side of the world, you have people who say, well, I'm a burgeoning. We just got a car because we just got a road, and we mm -hmm. just got jobs that were taken from you and given to us. And now, after you've oppressed us for many, many centuries, using your slavery analogy and Jim Crow and all the rest of apartheid, and now you want us to give it back and live like we were living before because you went and sucked up everything. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, oh, and by the way, um, Coke Brothers just started running, or Coke just started, uh, those brothers just started running these commercials on BET and, and, and Spanish TV and MSNBC, which is leaning so-called left, showing happy black people who are in Hispanics who are working for them and making money. So 40 years ago, 50 years ago, 70 years ago, for my grandparents, for my great-grandparents, for my parents, it was about voting for people, voting for policies that made my children's lives better, my grandchildren's lives better, people I will never meet, but I know will have this planet. And right now, you have people like me, other people of all shapes, sizes, and colors who have to vote for just to eat for themselves and hope that they can eat half of it and feed their children, who were formerly known as the middle class. Um, how do we how do I take my 17-year-old daughter who thinks she should have a car because she's entitled to it because it's in the Constitution <laughs> and tell her that, and her friends and others like her, who's not wealthy or far from it, and tell them that this is, well, you can, but you'll probably fry and you'll have a horrible existence. <laughs> and, you know, she can, I can only, you know, have her read so many Margaret Atwood books. And then, so what would you recommend? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. That was awesome. I appreciate that. Um, so there was a lot in there. And it's interesting, um, you know, what, what actually brought me to this issue in the first place was the issue of climate debt. Um, this was uh, explained to me. I was actually working on an article for Harper's um, Magazine about reparations, about reparations for slavery and colonialism. And it was a, a piece like what ever happened to the reparations debate because, you know, it's back now, but it was a pretty hot topic um, at, at, at the, um, well, it was a pretty hot topic in, in 2000 and 2001, and then we know what happened. Um, and so I was doing this follow-up piece, and somebody suggested that I talk to a young woman named Angelica Navarro, who was Bolivia's ambassador to the World Trade Organization. And because Bolivia is a poor country, she also was given the climate portfolio. And she was in her 30s at the time, trade and climate. So, um, And I met with her in Geneva while I was reporting this story, and she laid out the argument to, uh, for me for climate debt. And she said, look, you, exactly what you said. Um, you, know, you guys have been emitting fossil fuels for 200 years. Um, we barely emitted any, and our glaciers are melting, um, you know, our primary water source. Um, you owe us. Um, but the good news is that um, in paying back this debt um, through technology and resources and support, um, we can leapfrog over fossil fuels. Um, we can pull ourselves out of poverty, but not replicate your patterns if we work together. And this is what I mean by the, the fact that climate change really does challenge these, these sort of core competitive values. And this is why at the Heartland Institute, they talk about it as you know, a plot to redistribute wealth. And they're not entirely wrong, because the truth is that we cannot deal with the climate crisis without dealing with economic inequality within our countries and between them. Um, and, and, you know, if you think that's the end of the world, then you've got a problem. But, you know, what, what Angelica laid out for me was what she called a Marshall Plan for Planet Earth that would heal the wounds of colonialism. And, you know, it was a, a deeply inspiring vision. It's what started me off on, on this journey. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, as far as your daughter's car is concerned, um, <laughs> how do I get my two-year-old not to want to play with dump trucks all day, you know? Um, we all face our individual challenges. Um, but, you know, the truth is, is that, um, you know, when we think about bad timing, right? Um, it isn't just that climate change hit us at this moment when it became hard to regulate and when we were privatizing everything. Um, it's also that it came to us at this moment where as part of this project, we supersized the American dream and then exported it around the world. And that is intimately linked to the emissions explosion that has happened in this period. But it is also intimately linked to the fact that consumption now occupies this really outsized 
place in our lives. You know, it's, it's our pastime, it's our holidays, it's how we form identity and community. In other words, it stands in for all the things that we tore apart in this period. Uh, it stands in for so much of the community that fell apart in the public sphere and so on. So I think as we respond to this crisis and rebuild the idea of the communal and the collective and rebuild our communities and our relationships, maybe, hopefully, we will need to shop a little less. Um, uh, because it's not that you know we can't have anything, it's just that we can't have everything. Um, so, yeah. Great. Oh. And there's a woman on the far left there, about five rows from the back. Oh, just wait for the mic, please. Uh, thank you. Terrific. I'm wondering if you can take the racial and economic uh, discrimination and disparities analysis into the question of permanent war, which we seem to be in a juggernaut about. See, this is what happens when you start connecting the dots. It's just like everything is in there, right? But it's true. Why wouldn't it be? Climate change, you know, this is our home. And, um, and, and it is true um, that, that the, the, well, first of all, the, the military is the single largest um, consumer of fossil fuels in this country, and it, it, it consumes and burns those fossil fuels often with the goal of accessing other fossil fuels and protecting fossil fuels in other parts of the world. Um, so if we're thinking about, you know, some of the ways in which that dealing with this crisis are not all sacrifice, are not all tragedy, not all the end of the world, um, no, this is a big one um, because oil fuels our conflicts. It fuels our, our wars um, in so many ways. So, you know, I think that, that that is, thanks for that question, and I'm not going to give a huge long speech because I keep giving a huge long speech, but good point. All right, we have time for maybe one more question. Yes, the gentleman in the uh, third row here with the blue shirt, please. I'm uh, curious what your view might be on a, the efficacy of a substantial and rising tax on fossil fuels, mm -hmm. as a first step at least. Yeah. yeah. So that's, um, you know, I'm in favor of a, of a carbon tax, but it has to be a just carbon tax. Um, and I think the fact that, that prices are low for now is a good time to talk about introducing a carbon tax because when 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 prices are high, you're in the middle of an economic uh, recession, um, and people are paying so much at the pump, saying, "And plus, we're going to slap a tax on that." You know, that's that's hard timing. That said, um, you know, I think the way in which we pay for 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 the costs of climate change has to be based on a polluter pays principle, um, and and um, it cannot be passed on to consumers systematically um, while letting the fossil fuel companies themselves off the hook. Um, so I think it is important to have a price on carbon to create the right incentives in the market. It has to be a progressive tax. Um, we, and you know, there's lots of ways that it can be designed. One of the ways it's being talked about now is this revenue ne neutral carbon tax where it's just giving everybody equal checks back the tax and dividend model or the cap and dividend model because we're not allowed to say tax. I think that's a bad idea personally. I know there's a fair bit of momentum around it and a lot of people who I respect are advocating for it. I, you know, I read James Hansen's piece about why he's in favor of, of, of uh, cap and dividend and, he's, and you know, one of the arguments he's, he made is he thought that Republicans would like it because it's not really a tax because the government doesn't keep any money. Personally, I don't think this is going to be a bipartisan win in, in that way. So I think that we can, you know, pre-compromise um, in the hopes of getting people we're never going to get on board. And then in the process, you know, this revenue neutral thing, it's a problem. We need the money, right? We, we need the money to, to pay for infrastructure, to pay for transit. To, so I think, I think pricing carbon is important, but it has to be done in a progressive way. It's not the only way we need to, to, to introduce a polluter pay framework either. There are other mechanisms too, equally important, including increasing royalties, export tax, financial transaction taxes, because it's all of us super consumers that, you know, are, we're all polluters. It isn't just fossil fuel companies. So, you know, luxury taxes are another way of dealing with the fact that people, the highest income earners are also the biggest emitters. Um, and then we do need to have rebates for, um, for, for, for lower income people, absolutely. Um, uh, 
but I also think that we need to choose our pa policy battles well. So I don't think it has, can just be about attacks. I actually think that there should be, like, I, I'm more excited about campaigns demanding free public transit. Um, because I think that that gets at the core issues around increasing necessary public services, job creation, um, fighting inequality because uh, pu public transit is, is critical for, for communities of color to access to jobs and so on. Um, and um, these, the, the, there are movements already demanding not just affordable public transit but free public transit. We saw riots in Brazil ahead of the World Cup uh, demanding exactly that. A lot of what we, you know, part of, part, some of the mistakes we make is we don't even see the climate activists um, who are already doing that work because, because they don't use the word climate change because they are fighting for economic justice. Um, and, but but P.S., that's also a climate solution. So part of it is about going to people where they're at, the priorities they already have. So yeah, carbon tax is important, but I, I think sometimes it, it takes on a religious significance in the climate movement, and I think we need to be doing a lot of things simultaneously. Ladies and gentlemen, unfortunately, that's all we have time for. Please join me in Thank thanking you. Naomi Klein. Thank you.